Good morning and welcome. I'm Marcia Tucker, the librarian of the Historical Studies Social Science Library, and I'm very pleased that the library could participate in today's information session. We have a lot of introductions to make and a lot of content to cover, and I hope that what our presentations will be succinct but give you enough information to know who you need to speak with about certain questions. And if we run out of time, please do approach um, staff directly. This is the second session of its type, and I welcome your suggestions at the end of today's session, for both for content and as also for, um, for presentation. Now, turning to my area of responsibility, I'm hoping today that to introduce the staff of the library, of both libraries actually, um, talk about our services and resources, talk about the library collection, resources available to you at neighboring Princeton University Library System as well as uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. Starting with the staff, I'm going to ask that they stand when I introduce them. Kirsty Venanzi is our acquisitions librarian and works also with Firestone Services. Dana Van Meter works with cataloging and technical services and you'll see her here later in the day so you can always bring problems and questions to her and she'll forward them on to, if need be. Cecilia Palmer works with Firestone Service as well as cataloging. Karen Downing is our interlibrary loan officer. We have a lot of partners, both in this country and internationally. And if you have questions about interlibrary loan, do speak to Karen about that. Krista Van Ness works with periodicals and also preservation and conservation. Nancy Kriegner works, you'll see her both in the dining hall as well as in the library. She works with our circulation system. Casey Westerman is our institute archivist and the archival assistant is Erica Mosner. In addition, you'll be meeting later Mamota Ganguli, who's the mathematics natural sciences librarian. We have a lot of services available to you. I've already mentioned interlibrary loan, um, but we also have some services that will save you time our Firestone Library services. Firestone Library is Princeton University's largest humanities library. And um, we have two individuals who go over once a week each, so Tuesdays and Thursdays, and will scan for you as long as this copyright is not an issue. They will put books on hold under your name at Firestone Library Circulation System desk, or they'll bring books back for short-term consultation, one or two weeks. If you have any questions about these services, you can also find the forms for these on the library webpage under services. We also have a reference form there, but we're very informal and we ask that you just speak with somebody should you have a reference request because you get more information that way from you. Um, we also have a lot of scanning material and equipment in the library, so if you need any help with that, uh, we're glad to help you with that and situate you on that. We do return books to Firestone Library once a week, actually also to other libraries. It turns out you can return East Asian Library books also. So Thursday morning we ship them out. Um, all we ask is you don't return books that are due back with a short amount of time. So recalls are a bad thing because they could get lost in the system. We're open 24 hours, seven days a week. We do have an honor system in place. It's a great location to have that. So anytime something moves you can come into the library and work. And in June, you'll hear us doing our inventory. So we do about a third of the collection each June. We have two photocopies, copier scanners available to you, uh, as well as, like I mentioned, other scanners. The collection, as you might imagine, mirrors the interests of current and past faculty members. But in addition, we have libraries from Ernst Kantorowicz, uh, Millard Mies, um, Kirk Varnado also. So if you have a question about gift collections, we are often able to reproduce those collections and share with you the information about that. But you'll also find because of that gaps in the collection. And we look to you for your recommendations to fill in those gaps. In addition, of course, you're working away on your own book projects here. If you would let us know once you're, that they are completed and out, uh, so either we can acquire them or of course we love gifts. So as everyone does, so um, please consider that. We have over a thousand journal subscriptions available to you. We have mostly focused on paper subscriptions, turning to Princeton for the digital counterpart. So if you have suggestions also for our periodicals collection, please um, bring them to me. 
We have some other special collections, somewhat unprocessed or processed. The Walter Heisig Mongolian Library was given to the Institute partly on deposit, partly as a gift from Princeton University. So uh, if you're working with Tibetan materials, you might find something there of interest. Um, there's still some materials related to that that have not yet been processed. And also we have a German Enlightenment library that was put together by Giorgio Tonelli. So if you're working on German Enlightenment, come and, come and use that collection. We continue to support nonprofit scholarly initiatives in terms of databases. But as you can imagine, there's so many subject areas covered by the Institute. We're very fortunate that Princeton University has opened up their collections for us to use. Um, and partly that's related to a, an agreement um, that we had with Princeton University. Back in the 1940s, the Board of Trustees uh, gave monies to help fund the construction of Firestone Library. And in return, you have faculty, full faculty status there. Um, what that means is you can borrow books now through June 15th. You can use materials off-site um, that are digital. But you will need to get a library card, and for that, uh, you'll have to go to the access office, which is to the right of the main entrance as you go into the library. While you're there, if you like to print, uh, you might want the Ferris Print System account as well. And books are due back generally from Firestone Library on June 15th. Is there anyone from the math, natural science world at all? Um, Lewis Library has a shorter turnaround for how often uh, for their books and when they are due back. Some collections, such as the art and archaeology collection, don't circulate at all. For that collection, you can get a shelf in Marquand Library, and that allows you to at least pull together the books that you want to use. Princeton has a lot of off-site storage. They have Annex A and B in the recap facility, and if you are lucky and have a book that you need a chapter from in the recap facility, um, you can request, actually, a scan be made of a specific chapter and sent to you. So I just want to point that out. Um, often those scans will be sent out within 24 hours, but you will need a Princeton University Library ID card. The recap facility is also off-site, and they have a reading room there if you have a pressing need or need to use multiple volumes. So there is a way to often consult that material through that reading room. Uh, for Princeton University Library's digital collections, if you're on the wired network at the Institute, that means the campus and housing, you will not need any special credentials for um, logging in for that. It's, we have it uh, through a squid proxy system yet, I believe, and it'll take you right there. And we maintain that list. So if you hit a wall and you, it doesn't let you in some database, do let me know. I will test to see if it's a publisher problem, library subscription problem, internet problem, computing problem. There's a lot of problems that can happen. But we can figure it out, and we don't want you to have barriers. Um, wireless networks are uh, for that environment, you will need IS Scholar. And I know Jonathan Peel and Brian Epstein are here, so they can talk to you a little further about that. Um, off campus, you can use the VPN, vpn.is.edu, or also use uh, Pulse. Pulse Secure, I believe. Princeton Net IDs are needed for some resources, not everything. But if you're, for instance, trying to borrow a book from eBrary, you will need the Net ID. If you're simply trying to print or uh, download a PDF, they won't ask for that. Um, we have a room in Firestone Library available to you. If you find yourself working over there and you want to be more comfortable, uh, it has shelving, it has comfortable chairs, it has a desk. I have the key cards, so you just have to come and sign one out. Um, okay. Princeton Theological Seminary Library just ex um, expanded the number of books you can borrow from them to about 100 or more. So if you're using any theological materials now, we have more uh, benefits with that relationships. Um, and the books do circulate for a shorter amount of time. That's the only downside. Are any questions before I pass the baton over to Casey Westerman, who will talk about the archives? So I'm going to, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, for attending. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about the Shelby White and Leon Levy Archive Center of the Institute. And this is just uh, kind of a moment to tell you who we are, what we are, where we are, what we do, and what we have. Um, so the Shelby White and Leon Levy Archive Center is the archives of the Institute for Advanced Study. 
Uh, we document the Institute's history and the many significant people who have shaped it. We welcome inquiries from within. We welcome inquiries from both within and outside the Institute community. Uh, the Archive Center provides reference service with access to all non-restricted materials to all researchers. Uh, the records that we have in the Archive Center, they date back to the 1930s, and primarily what we have are the administrative records of the Institute. We also have the papers of select faculty members, uh, the Institute's photograph collection, and a growing oral history collection. And to just sort of demonstrate from our website, the thing that um, people may most be interested in seeing first is our digital collections. And as they're, the browsable form here is arranged um, alphabetically, which means that our Einstein photos are right up top, um, followed by art on the Institute campus. Um, very browsable, uh, worth looking around, accessible through other um, other aspects of our website as well. Since the establishment of the Archive Center in 2009, we have, in addition to collecting administrative records, we have been collecting the personal papers of Institute faculty. Uh, if you go to our Collections and Finding Aids site, you'll be able to see the Institute records that we collect, as well as the faculty papers. But um, as we did not have an archive center before 2009, uh, many, many collections of papers of uh, institute faculty and administrators have, before that time, they were uh, housed in other institutions. Um, so the personal papers of those individuals can be accessed from our collections page, and you can see their arranged here, and Einstein, in this case, takes first place, not alphabetically, but due to uh, his, his uh, let's say, his, his prominence and fame, uh, as a really large number of questions that we get have to do with Albert. Uh, so again, um, these holdings are available for research. They are subject to some restrictions placed by offices and donors. Most notably, institute administrative records are closed, from, closed for 30 years from their date of creation. Uh, this means that anything from 1930 to 1985 should be open, uh, with the exception of letters of reference, which are closed until after the deaths of the recommender and the recommendee. Uh, photocopying is available at 20 cents per copy. Scans in PDF format uh, are provided at no charge. Uh, digital files are available and you're welcome to bring a digital camera and use that for images for personal use. Our reading room is in the annex of the Historical Studies Social Science Library. Uh, staff, which is myself and archives assistant Erica Mosner, uh, we are available to help you from, well, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, you can reach us at archives at IAS.edu. Uh, we do encourage people to make an appointment to view these collections just so that we can have things ready for you uh, when you show up. Um, are there any questions about the archives at the Institute? Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, as Marcia said, I'm Jonathan Peel, Computer Manager for the Information Technology Group. Um, pretty much we're here to try to get technology out of your way. Uh, Pretty much, let's start with the Institute's page. <laughs> you can always find out about computing by starting at the Institute's page and going under Administration and Resources. And you see right here where it says Computing. Okay. ITG is right at the top there, where it should be, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> ITG stands for Information Technology Group, and we do all sorts of things. And our website provides information that covers everything from printing to email. But more importantly, it shows who we are. These are some of the people that um, you, you will come into contact with. Myself, 
um, Dan um, Franciscus, who is our Windows system admin. He's also responsible for building the Windows image that's sitting on your desktop system. So anytime you, anytime you have suggestions, send them an email, say, hey, it would be great. Um, the next person, Michael Morris, is responsible for our Unix backend systems and also for the Mac OS X image um, that sits on your desktops. Um, next person, I'm sure people have come into contact with. Mandeep and Kimberly, they're both, both of them are computing support specialists. They work at the help desk and our intern, Andrew Ashir, and we just recently hired a new intern. Um, his name is Joey Gupta and he just started Monday. So you'll see him and hear him very soon. We're kind of prepping him right now. Um, okay, um, those are the staff members. We're open eight to five, um, methods of contact, email, voicemail, Anything you can throw at us, we can probably do in terms of um, reaching you. We can do remote access to your IS managed machines, um, so no problem that. However, whichever way you like to receive support, we can provide it. Um, no question is a dumb question. Don't sit there thinking, I wonder if I can do that. Call us, pick up the phone, ask ITG. That's even our email address, askitg at is.edu. Can't get any simpler than that. <laughs> so don't, don't hesitate, don't wait, because that thing you may want on your machine, we may have it, or we may know how to get it, so just ask. Next, website. Um, you, we're already at the WWITG website. Um, you can see the URL at the top there. Okay, providing lots of helpful information. And if we go back here, Right at the top of top support items, working from off campus, very useful document. What we did was um, we gathered all the information that would be helpful to members who were um, working off of campus or if you're using your own device, the same type, the same information applies. Like if you're using your own laptop or desktop system. Okay, oops, sorry, let me go back here. Oh, okay. And so this working from off campus covers everything from, can I move this laptop up? I'm, t I'm so tall, it's like bending all the way down to the floor to reach it. Okay. Okay. So, some great pieces of information your credentials are very important. Treat them as if they're a credit card. Um, protect them at all times. Uh, Brian Epstein will be talking about Wi-Fi um, access. Basically, you just need to know there are multiple networks and they do different fun things, and he'll cover that. Um, it covers information on setting up your email. Also, VPN. VPN is a way in which um, we can make um, your machine part of our network remotely. So if you're at Starbucks somewhere there, and you have internet access, there's a way to use the VPNs. There's um, a way to either go to a web browser, which we call an SSL-based um, VPN server. Just go to a web address called vpn.is.edu. And um, all this information is on this page, so all you need to do is know how to get to WWITG, hit that top link for support on working from offline. So you don't have to write it down. Um, we'll, it'll be right there. But you can use a web browser, go to the VPN server, log in with your IS credentials, and there's a link for Princeton University Library Resources. Click it, you're good. Now, the second method is using a piece of software called Pulse Secure. This software installs on the machine that you're working on. Like if you own a personal laptop, there's even an app for it. If you have um, a iOS device, like an iPhone or something, that you can install that. Once you install that piece of software and activate it, it, it um, funnels all of your traffic from your machine to the institute and then onward, okay? So the the web browser, SSL VPN, all it's doing is taking whatever URL you type in there and kind of sending it to a tunnel and, and then going off to where it needs to go. It's just the web browser URL to 
to pull the information in. Whereas the piece of software that installs on the machine, it's any application that's running on your machine will then have access to, um, to restricted resources or something local. Okay, anyway. And some of those restricted services that ITG provides are remote app. Remote app is a way of learning, of running um, remote software from your machine when you're off campus. Let's say you needed to access um, Photoshop and you don't have it on your personal laptop. You could use VPN, connect to the Institute, then go to the remote app server, launch Adobe Acrobat, and um, hopefully if you have a lot of bandwidth, <laughs> you could manipulate a large file that's local on your machine using it because the software is really running on our server right here. So, and so that becomes a way of gaining access to software that's not used often. Um, so, great. Um, mounting your IS network drive. That's another difference between the SSL VPN and the Pulse Secure. Um, the SL, SSL VPN has kind of like this web browser um, type um, navigation where you click links to go into your directory down and you download it onto your desktop system, you, min you make changes to it, then you upload it, upload it back into the directory. That's um, through the SSL VPN. Through um, Post Secure, since all of your traffic is being tunneled to the Institute, you could just map your network drive to your machine and then it appears and works just like a regular hard drive a network drive with access to it. You just open up your application, connect to it, poof, easy. Okay, so those are the differences between the two VPNs. Okay, um, protecting your environment, that's a no-brainer now that there's viruses and all sorts of things everywhere. Um, always um, protect your systems. Um, if you have your own system, um, use antivirus. If you don't have antivirus, um, there are links on, on our website, on the security website, on how to gain access to free antivirus. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Desktop systems in your offices. Um, the one thing to remember is that the desktop is not backed up. So if you leave anything on a desktop and something happens to the machine, it's gone. Save yourself to the network drives. Um, this is the iDrive on the Windows machine and it's the, the dock folder on your Mac machine. That's, um, when you save it to that network drive, it is backed up um, and it's snapshot hourly between the hours of, I say, nine to five or nine to eight or something. So if you start working on a document at nine um, and by 12, you're like, oh my God, this is horrible, but I haven't been saving copies along the way. There's a way for us to show you how to access um, if you've been if you've been making um, if you've been saving along the way, but not making different copies of it along the way. There's a way for you to access those um, previous saves. Okay, so okay, if they're during those some um, time periods, and plus um, your information will be um, backed up once a month to tapes, and then those tapes are taken off campus, and then you'll have access to that information for up to about a year. So if you're away someplace and you go like, I cannot find this, and I know it was on my, my um, network drive at the Institute for over a month, so you can contact us and we can. Okay, okay. and then um, what else do we have here? Just some general links to um, fun stuff. Um, uh, let's see, help desk. IS email continuity service. Basically, if all of the institute goes down, there's a way for you to still get your mail that's sent to the institute oh, from off campus, of course, because if it's all down, you're not going to be doing much here. <laughs> okay. Um, finally, video conferencing. If you, on your desktop machines, you have access to Skype. If you need something stronger, we have um, video um, conferencing rooms. If you need something even better than that, like you need to talk to someone um, on um, a broadcast room, we have a broadcast room. Okay, good to know. Okay. Housing, Wi-Fi is throughout housing. Let us know if there's weak signal. I'm sure um, Brian will may speak on that also. Network jacks, if you want to know the thorough put on them, they're full 1,000 as fast as your office jacks. If you ever plug anything into it wired, um, but most people use wireless now. 
Very good. Community Center has a um, printer and workstation, so you can print from your home to the printer in the activity center. Okay. Okay. Things to watch out for, spam and phishing attacks. No IT, no one here will contact you for your credentials and ask you to send them or go to any type of form <laughs> to put them in. And I mean, the last time someone has won a international lottery, I don't know when it was, but <laughs> so be aware if it's, if it sounds weird or don't do it. It's no harm in not doing it. Just calling us to say, hey, <laughs> Um, this seems kind of fishy. <laughs> okay. And um, other than that, I wish all of you a happy and productive year here. And if you have any questions, just contact us. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm the friendly security guy. I don't know from where you came from, but in a lot of institutions out there, you have security that is just beating their heads against what you're trying to do and get your work done. The whole point of the Institute is curiosity-driven research unburdened by these things. And that is what my vision is as far as information security goes and as far as access to our network. Um, so although there are things that I will have to distract you from your research in order to take care of, in general, uh, my team and myself, we try to stay in the background and we try to stay out of your hair and what you're trying to do. Um, I put up the, the three tenets of security uh, that I always talk about in the, sorry, in the logo. Um, uh, whenever you talk to any security professional, um, they always talk about these three things which go into every security program, which is availability, confidentiality, and integrity. And if I worked at a bank, obviously confidentiality and integrity would be the most important things that I'm, I'm concerned with. Here at the Institute, uh, availability is what, what I'm very concerned with um, as number one, is getting you to the resources that you need in order to get your research done and doing it securely. So confidentiality and in integrity are, are close behind availability. And we work very diligently and very hard in order to, in order to get you to those resources safely and also in order to keep the malicious hackers out, um, as every other institution uh, across the world, we're under constant attack. And we work very hard to keep those attacks away from getting to you, your desktop, and to your work. Um, so we, we do a lot of innovative computing things in order to get you to where you want to go, and one of which uh, Marsha alluded to was the Princeton Library Electronic Resources. Uh, so we've created this methodology where uh, your web browser, when it tries to go to a resource um, that's offered by Princeton University, automatically gets redirected under the, under the, you know, under the cover in, in a way that you don't even know it's happening. And again, we're trying to get out of your hair. We're trying to keep the distractions away, get you to what you need to, to get to. If you do have a problem getting to a resource, though, you know, please contact Marsha, contact Momota, contact myself um, so that we can get you there and, and get that block out of the way. Um, as much innovation as we do in order to keep you safe, at the end of the day, you need to keep yourself safe. And this goes for yourself. And if you brought any family with you here to the Institute, uh, them as well. So we do have an acceptable use policy so that our network and our resources are available to everyone. Um, and so that's something that we ask everybody just to take a look at. And hopefully we won't have any, any problems. Just a reminder, the network is um, a privilege here. Uh, and so we, we usually don't have to go over any problems or anything of that nature. But please, you know, just be careful and be respectful of, of the, the network and what you're doing on it. Uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, this is the security website, since we're, we're showing lots of websites. Um, so if you have any security-related things that you're curious about or uh, resources, if your machine at home is infected with a virus and you want to know how to clean it up or how to get rid of it, please come to the security website. Uh, we do offer personal antivirus protection for uh, Windows computers. So if you have a Windows computer that you brought with you, your antivirus, it 
expired <laughs> three years ago, um, and you would like to update it to you know a, uh, a a very good antivirus program, we offer it to you free for your for your time, um, and also your family members. So if if your family members have brought a computer, uh, if you have a Macintosh computer, uh, it is the age at which you need antivirus. Um, there are bad things out there for Macintosh computers. Uh, uh, on my website, I have a couple links to some free antivirus software for Mac um, that works very, very well. So I, I really suggest people install that. Uh, along with that, um, I want to talk about Wi-Fi access here and wireless access on our campus. One of the things that, um, that I need to bring up is when you bring your personal devices to our campus, we try very hard to support everything we can. Um, however, if you're bringing a device that's 10 years old, um, that has one of the very first technology wireless cards in it, something of that nature, unfortunately, it's probably not going to work on our network. We need to keep our network extremely fast and with the, with the, the latest technologies. Um, so if you do run into a problem like that, you know, please let us know. We'll try to work with you. But at the end of the day, we may not be able to support uh, older computers or older devices that, that are brought to the network. Um, so let me, let me take you to the wireless setup so that, that I can explain why we have so many different wireless networks and what they're used for. And John, thanks for putting this up here because it's much easier <laughs> to type on. So we primarily have three wireless networks that you'll be, cons you'll be concerned with. Um, and it really depends on what you would like to do as far as getting onto our network. If you need access to our library resources, for example, you need to join our IAS Scholar Network, um, which is right there in the middle. This is a protected network. It's an encrypted network. It's encrypted to your, um, uh, it's authenticated by your access credentials, so your ITG login, username, password, or your school's username, password. It has access to the Princeton Library resources, and it's available all over our campus, including housing and all of our buildings. We strive very hard to cover every inch of our campus, buildings, and apartments with wireless coverage. If you're having an issue with wireless coverage, please contact the help desk, contact my team, um, so that we can get out there and get you what you need in order, again, to get you the access that you need. So that's the IES Scholar Network. Only put it on devices you really need access to the Princeton Library resources. For the rest of your devices, for your PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo that you brought with you um, for all your free time, uh, feel free to use our IAS network. This was the original network that we had here. It's meant to be a guest network um, for your family members or for you know, anybody else who doesn't need access to the Princeton Library resources. It's an unsecured network, um, so you know while you're using it, please uh, take care to look at how you're using it uh, as far as connecting to banks, making sure that it's protected with um, certificates and things of that nature. Um, but it's, it's there, and again, it's available in every place that the rest of these wireless are available. And the third one is Eduroam. Now, Eduroam is a federated service across universities around the world. And if a university participates, like uh, the Institute does, what it allows you to do is take your laptop that's already been configured for Eduroam, take it with you to another college or university, open it up, and you're on the network. There's no registration. There's no username password. There's no agreements. There's, you, you're, just, you're on the network. And the idea is to make, again, things easier for you when you travel. So if you're doing a lot of traveling, especially if you're going to Princeton University, uh, make sure that you set up the edge room, have it there and waiting on your laptop for when you get to your destination and you can immediately get onto the wireless. Edge room will obviously work here on our campus, but there's really no benefit of using it. You don't get access to the Princeton Library resources, but if you're traveling up to Rutgers or you're traveling um, around the world to, to another institution, it's, it's very useful to have. So those are our three wireless networks, and like John had also mentioned, you have Ethernet, 
in your apartments, you have extra ethernet in your, um, in your offices, uh, a wired ethernet connection is always going to get you faster, more reliable speed than wireless. So again, for your usage, that may be, may be an option. Uh, so uh, tomorrow is October. October is my favorite month because it's Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And that's the month where we inundate you with information about how to protect yourselves, uh, including two seminars that I'll be giving, uh, which will go over ways for you to protect yourself and for your family to protect themselves. So please, when you see the invite, come, bring your family, bring friends, bring anybody that you would like. And we can talk about security and simple ways that you can uh, secure yourself and operate on the, the internet without uh, as much risk. At the end of the day, we can put as many firewalls and protections and intrusion detection and IPS and all these great things into place, uh, but you are my eyes and ears. And nobody's working on your computer as much as you are. So if you notice something, if you notice something strange or something out of the ordinary, please let me know. Please let the help desk know. Let us help you um, because we can't see everything that you, that you are seeing while you're working there. Uh, obviously, if you have a desktop that was built by one of our help desks, you have access to the Princeton Library resources. You don't have to worry about wireless networks or any of that. It just works. Um, my group also runs the VPN, which is the remote access or access from abroad. Again, feel free to use it. If you're sitting in a Starbucks, even if you're not doing research, uh, it may not be the safest place for you to do computing. So feel free to use the VPN, come through us, and do it in a secure manner. And then that way, it's just one more level of protection that, that we can offer for you. So that's really all I had to say. Again, please come out to the Cybersecurity Awareness Seminars. It's only an hour of your time, and I guarantee you, you'll be entertained. So thank you very much. All right. Well, welcome to the Institute, you guys. This is great that you're here. Um, term is just starting, and so everybody's, I'm sure, excited to get started. So I'm going to talk to you about a new program, which is actually sort of Fast forwarding to the end of your time here, so that's sad. But for a moment, we're gonna just think about that. Um, this is new to the Institute, and so you guys are the first cohort of members who are gonna have access to this. So your feedback is really important. You know, is this helpful to you? Is it interesting? Can we do it better? The whole focus of the program is on finding um, funding for your research for after you leave the Institute. So one of the things that we hear a lot from members is how wonderful their time was with us, how they had so many ideas that came to them in this you know, time that they've had away from their normal lives. They've met all these interesting people. And at the end of the time here, they're really sad to leave. Um, so, so the thinking is, we don't want you to be sad to leave. We want to have helped to set you up to keep doing the work that you've started here. And so that's what this program is about. OK, Einstein. As uh, Casey was saying, we get a lot of questions about him. You guys are going to feel like he's still present among us because that's how often he gets mentioned. But um, the most important thing is not to stop questioning. These are not the questions he had in mind, but they're questions relevant to this presentation. Um, so what's the program all about? As I said, it's really about helping you guys find money to keep doing your research after you leave us. And who am I? Um, as Marsha mentioned, I'm the academic officer at the Institute. Uh, this is a relatively new position for us, but basically I work with the director um, on director's initiatives having to do with academics. Um, and this is one of them. So my background is as an academic researcher. My background is also in development. So I have a lot of experience working with faculty and, and people such as yourselves um, to find money for whatever your area of research is. OK, so what can I do in this program? I can help you to think about what your research is and really winnow it down to specific projects. So this is something, and I know from firsthand experience, when you're in the trenches and this is your passion, it can be very, very hard to go from here down to something that's really finite that you can look for money to support. Um, so sometimes just talking to somebody who's not you and not your spouse and you know, sort of not entrenched in it with you can be really helpful because that person, in this case me, can say, you know, this element of what you're talking about is really exciting and let's see if we can kind of bring that down to something that's actionable and that you can come up with work steps. 
Um, I can help you find funders who might be interested in supporting your work. You may already be well funded and you know know everybody who's sort of in your space, and that's great. And some people are in that position, others aren't, and so sometimes it's helpful again to just have somebody to sit down with and you know kind of do the research and, and figure out who might be there to support you. I can go through the terms of the opportunities with you. So when we find an RFP, an RFQ, um, a call for LOIs, and it's like, okay, what exactly are they looking for? And you'd be amazed in working with very senior faculty how this step can sometimes trip people up. Because again, you're really excited about it. You're excited about your work. And sometimes the minutia that's important to a funder, you sort of glaze over it because you're so ready to just go for it. So again, I can be that annoying person who says, hey, did you see that your CV needs to be formatted like this? And you'll go, oh, okay, I'll do it. Um, so it can be very helpful. Um, and then I can give you feedback on your materials. So you've written your proposal, you really like it, but you need somebody to look at it and just say yay or nay, or you know, maybe rethink this piece. Particularly with private donors, this can be important because I'm sort of educated lay audience for most of you. I can almost guarantee that I don't do research in any of your areas. I'm environmental policy. Anybody here environmental policy? No. So what's nice about that is that I can look at it and say, okay, you know, does this make sense to me? Because the people who are reviewing your materials are probably more like me than they are like you in that they have a good education, they're interested in the topic, but they're not an expert. Um, so just giving you that kind of feedback. What I can't do, so this is the sad part. Um, I don't write your proposal. This is all sort of like, of course. Um, I'm not gonna find collaborators. You guys know your field, obviously, very, very well. Now, being here, hopefully you're gonna meet new people to collaborate with um, through the faculty, through fellow members. So this is a great opportunity for that. Uh, your home institution, because by definition this program is for after you leave, they're going to be one, the ones processing the awards, so it won't be the institute, so it won't be me. I can, if you're not super familiar with how that works, I can kind of help you navigate it, um, but really all of the logistical stuff about accepting the money and making sure you get the money, that happens back home. Um, and obviously we don't process your award here. Okay, so where does this fit into the lifetime of an award? Um, you have your need, right? This is what you want to do. This is what you need money for. You find the opportunity. Either it's a funder who you think you can sort of cultivate a conversation with, or it's an RFP, um, but it's a door that seems to be open. You submit something to them. Maybe it's, you know, you set up a chance encounter at a cocktail party and you start talking to them, or maybe it's a full-fledged LOI, um, but you get something in front of them. Hopefully that leads to money. Yay! Uh, that money comes in and it gets processed. Um, you actually do the research, and I know that this is really the only part you guys are interested in. Um, it's, you know, hiring your people, it's buying your equipment, doing whatever that research is, reporting back to the funder, unfortunately, um, publishing, going to conferences. So that, I know, is really where you guys are focused. Um, and then stewardship of that relationship. So ideally, you don't want this to be a one-off. You want them to say, you know what, their work was great, and I feel like we really connected around that project, and I want to continue to support them. So identifying what your need is, sort of winnowing down your idea, finding the opportunity, going through that submission process, those are all things that this program can work with you on. Not processing the award, not obviously doing the research, you're not going to be here for that. Um, and then stewarding the relationship is something that, that you would be doing. So we have some web resources, and I'm just going to see if I can find them. Um, hmm. Now we've got a bunch of stuff open. Yes, okay. Um, so I put together some websites and you'll see the first thing on here which will come down after today as the flyer for this event. Um, but these are just basic things. Um, and again, this is new for us, so hopefully this is useful. Um, the Institute does have a large number of postdoctoral individuals and so probably a little bit less experienced in, you know, looking for external funding. If that's the case or you just sort of want a refresher, that's what this page is about. Um, hopefully useful information. This, though, I think is really the page that's going to be of the most direct use to you. So these are the search engines that are available to you through the Institute for finding opportunities. And you're welcome, obviously, to access these at any time while you're here, even after you leave. Um, and I can also work with you um, to sort of hone your search. 
Um, Community of Science Pivot is really, I think, going to be your go-to. That one is, I think, in my opinion, the most useful. It agglomerates opportunities from the federal government, private sources, um, just really all over the place, and it's very user-friendly. Um, so that would be my first stop. The Foundation Directory Online focuses on private opportunities, so um, foundations, corporations. Uh, and what you see here is the public version. It's a little bit abbreviated compared to the paid version. So if you find something on there that's interesting, talk to me, and I'll, I have a paid subscription, so I can get you all the information on the donor. And that's things like 990s, it's past giving, um, it's contact information for program officers, so it really will set you up to get, get in the door there. Grants.gov, any of you who have federal funding, obviously very familiar with that. Um, and then there's some external resources down here that other people have pulled together. Guidance documents, um, this is obviously a very short list, but I just started on it. Um, that process of finding the project in your big idea, um, what a concept paper and, is and what an LOI is. So if you haven't written one of those before, it can be really daunting to sort of narrow down all of this great stuff that you're doing into a really succinct and finite description. So these will hopefully help you do that. And then this last link is just to get in touch with me so that we can set up an appointment. Um, my cards are on a paper back there, so you, know, you don't have to use this. I'm also in Fold Hall. If you see me around, don't hesitate to stop me. I'm, you know, it's one of the things I do is to, to work with you guys, so please don't be shy uh, if you have questions or anything along those lines. So that's the end of this one. And now I'm going to transition and talk to you guys very briefly about another program that's relatively new to the Institute that's hopefully uh, will be useful to you. Do you guys have any questions on that before I move on? Okay. I know it's a little bit early and I know it feels a little like, uh, I'm not ready to think about after I'm leaving. Um, but in a, you know, maybe six months or whenever you're, uh, it sort of becomes uh, relevant to you. I hope that you will take advantage of it because I'm very excited to, uh, to see if this is, oh no, if this is useful to you. So the next program that I'm going to talk about has to do not so much with you guys as with your family. So how many of you came to the Institute with somebody? Okay, yeah, a lot of people do, and that's great. Um, the Institute is very, very fr family friendly. Um, so what this program is about is you started out all over the world. Um, one of the great things about the Institute is people really do come from all over, and it's you know, it's a cliche, but it is a melting pot, um, and that's why it's so productive intellectually. Um, but no matter where you came from, you all ended up here, um, and here we are. Many of you didn't come alone. You probably have amazing, beautiful families like these. <laughs> or maybe you came with somebody like this. This is my son in the high heels. Um, so... And one of the great things about the Institute is that it really is super family friendly. My son is here all the time. Um, I know you guys probably have gotten a number of emails from Linda about the different events happening on campus. We're going to do the pumpkin carving thing in October. Um, so I hope that I see you guys around. And, you know, again, if you're here with your kids, please involve them in the community. It is actually really important to all of us to, to have kids and have families involved. Um, and that has really been the case sort of forever. Um, so we've always been very family friendly. What we're trying to do now is really be more proactive about connecting with your partners. So those of you who came with a spouse, I mean, we know that obviously they're here supporting your time as a member, but that doesn't mean that their careers and their interests sort of stop. And so we want to really make them, make you and them aware that there are resources to support them. And that's what this program is about. So I am just going to take you over very briefly to... Um, some web pages for this. And I hope that you'll point your partners toward this stuff and put them in contact with me. And I'd love to sit down and talk with them. And I've already gotten to do that a little bit with some of the partners and it's just great. I mean, they're all wonderful people. They're excited to be here and they're just sort of figuring out what they're gonna do with their time. Um, so hopefully this is helpful to them. This is also something, because it's new, I don't think it really happened so much with you guys, but we want to push this out before people get here so that as your partners are thinking about their time here, they have some resources to look at. 
So we have um, some frequently asked questions, and these really came from conversations with faculty, staff, and members about, you know, what are you wondering before you get here? If you have kids, you're wondering about school. If you keep kosher, you're wondering, you know, can I do that in housing, and how will that happen? Um, sort of logistical things about taking public transportation and all those things. So those are hopefully covered within the FAQs, and if they're not, you know, let me know and we'll add information. Another big one for people is finding employment while they're here. So obviously not everybody's partner is interested in that. Um, many of them are lucky enough to have employment back home that they can do remotely while you're here. Um, but some people are interested in finding something, uh, particularly those who are here for a longer period of time. Um, so we do have some resources that we've pulled together for that. Uh, Michael Klompas, who's going to talk to you right after me, is the head of HR, and he's agreed to look over people's resumes. Sometimes this can be really helpful, um, particularly for people who are not from the U.S. Um, but are interested in employment. And I'm going to give the visa caveat, which is if your visa allows you to work in the U.S., and that's something that Jennifer, who's sitting up in the back, um, can talk to you about if you have questions. Um, so we mentioned LinkedIn, obviously very important resource. Um, and then sort of finding opportunities. So a lot of our members, partners, are in academia as well. Um, so we have something called the Higher Education Recruitment Consortium, or HERC. There's two regional sort of clusters of that organization which are going to be relevant to people here. Um, those are the Metro New York and Southern Connecticut um, area and the New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania Delaware chapter. Um, so I don't know if a huge number of people really are aware of these, but locally they're great for finding jobs. And they're everything from, you know, adjunct positions through full tenured positions, maintenance. I mean, basically anything that happens in an academic environment, you'll find them there. Um, the Chronicle is, a, is an obvious one. Whatever your partner's discipline is, usually they'll have sort of a, you know, specific job, you know, sharing sites for those. And then because we're in the tri-state area, we have a huge number of academic institutions that are very close by. Um, so what, we, what I've done here is identify some of the ones that are sort of we're most familiar with um, in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And these web links will take you directly to their HR sites and to their job postings. And what I'd say is if your partner is interested in something and you don't have any connections there, ask them to reach out to us because we may know somebody and we may be able to sort of broker a conversation with them. So a lot of it is networking, as you guys know, and we would like to support them if this is something they're interested in. And then obviously not everybody is in higher education. The tri-state area is also great for pretty much any other type of employment, and so we'll try to support them in that as well. Um, let me just see. Going along with this idea of you know, them using their time productively, a lot of partners are here with their own research agendas. And so the privileges that you have as members, many of them extend to your partners as well. And so you've heard about you know, they can get a carol in the library. They have computing privileges. This page sort of spells out what those privileges are. And there's also things that you know, if there's a special accommodation that somebody needs, it's always worth asking because the Institute is incredibly accommodating. Um, so if you know that your husband, wife, partner is sitting at home thinking, oh my gosh, I wish I could do X, Y, or Z, ask us because a lot of the time we can make that happen for them. So it's, it's always worth asking. Um, and then this is just a feedback part. So if you have suggestions, thoughts, um, I would love to hear them. So that's it on this. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, great. So. Um, Again, these two programs are new to us, so if you want to, you know, let me know. If you check them out and you have thoughts on them, I'd love to hear them um, because we are looking to make this really useful for you. And the other thing is if there's things that come, it, come to you as you're here that you don't feel the Institute is sort of, you know, satisfying your needs in some area, let us know that. And, you know, a good way to do that is just if you see me or see one of us, just flag us and let us know because we're, you know, the staff is very proactive. We're also relatively small. And we really do want this to be that top-notch experience that you're expecting it to be. Um, so your feedback is always welcome on, on pretty much everything. All right, thanks. Blessing. Um, so since I am going last, just wanted to quickly thank you all for coming. And hopefully you benefited from the information provided by my colleagues. And I don't really have that much to say. Uh, simply because most of the interactions are on a one-to-one -one basis with what we're handling on your behalf in human resources that has to do with for example, the health insurance subsidy or any visa or work authorization issues. 
uh, but did want to flag a couple of things based off some feedback I received from prior members in terms of information. And they have to do primarily with the preschool subsidy, if it is applicable to anyone in this room, and the health insurance subsidy. So to find information about both, you can, if you go to under administration and resources and go to human resources, um, you'll see the member, and the member and visitor resources over here. And within there gives information about uh, the, about the preschool subsidy as well as with the, with the health insurance. So you could go to the website and you could read up on it in terms of eligibility or even better, you could stop by Fold 101 and come to, come to talk to us about it and we could discuss it if it's, if it's, if it's applicable for you. Um, the other thing that Josie briefly mentioned was the resume and this career services that, that we're now offering. Really do want to encourage you to come and, and speak to me or one of my colleagues about that. We can help you, the partner or spouse that you might have is interested in employment opportunities uh, with updating resumes and freshening things up. Also getting a better feel for the, for the local job market in Princeton as well as the surrounding areas including New York City. So we could certainly provide a resource for that um, if, it, if it's, applic if it's apl applicable for you. Um, the other thing I just also to quickly mention is in human resources, we're kind of this <clears throat> area where you could start with any general questions. Jennifer Hansen is my colleague in HR. She's the Visa and Visitor Services Coordinator. Uh, she knows the institute like the back of her hand. She knows the Princeton area incredibly well. She lives locally, um, is a tremendous resource. And please feel free with any general questions that come by. We can be your starting point. So. Don't hesitate to come by. If we don't have the answer, we'll look it up. We'll direct you to our colleagues who will have the answer. So really encourage you to do that. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted to briefly mention is about a year ago, the Institute started a committee on diversity. The committee itself consists of representation from across the entire Institute community. That includes faculty, staff, members, and trustees. And we're really working towards creating a diverse and welcoming environment for the Institute, especially for our members. Um, and wanted to specifically mention that because we're hoping in the, in the coming months to be able to create an assessment of which we're going to distribute to our, to our members and the rest of the institute community. We really want to solicit, solicit your feedback about your experience of being here. What are we doing well? What are we, where, where do we need to improve? What is, what is your real experience here? Uh, that feedback will be really valuable in terms of creating the best possible experience for you being here, but also want to say it doesn't need to be that formal. If at any point you do want to have a dialogue and have a discussion about your experience here, please come by. This information that we'd love to hear, we'd love to speak to you about. Um, so that's really um, everything that I had to say. Like I said, 